Good morning, church. Welcome to Redford Aldersgate. I'm Reverend Ben Bauer, and it's a joy to be with you here on this Sunday morning. Friends, if you're a guest that's visiting with us, I want to extend a special welcome to you. We're a church that seeks to make Christ's love visible through inclusivity, hospitality, and service. We're a church where we are black and white, we're LGBTQ and straight, we're rich and poor and differently abled. We come as we are to worship because God has loved us and invited us to be in worship today. So friends, welcome, and let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship this amazing God. Friends, uh, please be sure to comment on or interact with the video feed while you're here with us in worship today. Also, if you're a guest, uh, please be sure to like our Facebook page or like and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can stay up to date as things change around the life of the church. Now, I've got announcements for us this morning. Uh, one is that we have our Ash Wednesday service uh, that will be a drive-through operation, uh, and that's this Wednesday. Uh, we'll be doing that from 7 a.m. in the morning till 1 p.m. So come in before work or on your lunch break or sometime in the morning and we'll be available to provide you with ashes. We're doing that COVID safe, uh, trying to make as much distance as, as possible. Uh, we'll be wearing nylon gloves in order to apply ashes. Uh, if you would like to apply the ashes yourself, if you're looking for uh, some additional um, layers of protection there. Uh, we'll provide you with a prayer card, a little explanation about what Ash Wednesday is, and you can take uh, a little packet of ashes for you to apply at home. So I hope to see you there. This is inclusive. Everyone is invited uh, to come by Redford Aldersgate here to the church uh, for our drive-through Ash Wednesday. Also, we will be coming back to in-person worship next week. Uh, that's next Sunday, February 21st. We'll be doing a 9 a.m. worship service. Um, we've been tracking the, the data, trying to pay attention to how the pandemic is, is going, the course of the pandemic, and we're getting to a point where it seems like we should be in a good place through Lent, or at least a better place through Lent. Uh, we will continue to be doing COVID safe practices for, for worship, so we'll be keeping people not uh, outside of households, socially distant from one another, at least six feet distant from one another, every other pew, masks are required. Um, and we'll be doing that to, to keep everyone safe. And as we move along, uh, if things change, we'll make sure to keep all of you up to date uh, and abreast of how those changes will affect us here uh, as we worship together. So looking forward to, uh, to seeing those of you who are coming at 9 a.m. next Sunday for in-person worship. Uh, we will, of course, continue to have an online worship uh, service available for those who would like to continue to worship online. Um, that will be at 11 o'clock. So for those of you who will remain online, just tune in same time, same place, and we'll see you next Sunday. Thank you, friends. Uh, and with that, I want to uh, ask us to take a moment to prepare our hearts and our minds uh, to be in an attitude of prayer.
Friends, as we continue to prepare our hearts uh, and minds for prayer, there's a few prayers I want to lift up for you today, uh, one of which uh, comes with a, a bit of a mix of joy and, and heartache. Um, as I get to announce today that uh, Roberta Martin, our uh, administrator, executive director, will be retiring from her service here at the church uh, in April. And Roberta and I have been talking and praying over uh, for some time now um, when that day would come. And Roberta has served here uh, in that role as an administrator and executive director since 2014. And over the last seven years, um, she has given uh, so much of herself and her time uh, to this church, ensuring that we can do the ministry that we need to do. And I know that this decision was not uh, an easy one for her as well. But she has done an incredible job of keeping everything running behind the scenes and coordinating administration across our church. Her gifts to this congregation have gone far and beyond uh, the expectations of any staff position. And she will be leaving us, uh, uh, leaving this work in a, far, in a firm foundation for us to build off of. Her last Sunday as a staff member will be on April 11th. That's the Sunday after Easter. And as we approach that date, we'll be sharing more with all of you and how we plan on celebrating her ministry here at Redford Aldersgate. Uh, it's always difficult to, to make these sorts of staff transitions, especially when um, our staff and their presence has uh, become such an ingrained part of who we are as, uh, as a church. However, our lead team, Pastor Nadine and myself, uh, know that as we make this transition as a congregation, uh, Roberta and our entire church will be blessed far into the future because of what God has uh, been doing in her life and in ours. So let us take some time over these next few weeks to give thanks for all that Roberta has done as a staff member here and to celebrate what new adventures lay ahead for her in her retirement. Other prayers I want to lift up to you this morning. Uh, prayers for Kathy Spires, who is uh, now transitioning into hospice care. We want to lift up prayers for Gloria Campbell, who is in the hospital. And we want to lift up prayers for Michelle Fox, who recently received a cancer diagnosis. Friends, as we prepare our hearts and minds to lift up these, these wonderful people in our lives, we prepare ourselves here at Redford Dollars Gate by singing Spirit of the Living God. Let us pray. O Lord of infinite mercy, we are tempted today to make a whole production of this transfiguration event in our scripture because we wouldn't take the time to understand its significance for our lives. We often find ourselves in such a hurry to memorialize everything that has power and meaning that the power and meaning of the event becomes washed out or altered in our memories. This morning, Lord, help us to look upon Jesus with new vision, vision that sees him in light of the witness of the ages, that sees Jesus as the one who comes to set people free, to heal, to bring hope and peace. 
Make us ready to become faithful disciples rather than remaining dazzled by the mountaintop experience. Give us strength and courage this day to witness Jesus' love by the many deeds of mercy and justice we can offer in his name. For we offer ourselves imperfect but willing to serve. God, we lift up the people and situations in our lives that are in desperate need of your hope and your care and your healing. In particular, Lord, this morning we lift up Kathy Spires. We pray, O oh Lord, that as um, she's cared for in, in hospice, that you would pour out your spirit upon her, that your love would be evident to her, God, and that you would give us comfort and courage as we seek to support her and her family. We pray, O oh Lord, for Gloria Campbell. We ask, O oh God, that she would be healed, be made well, that her doctors and nurses would take extra care with her, that their wisdom would be yours and not their own. We pray for Michelle Fox. We pray, God, that you would bless her, that in this time that is, can be confusing and scary and heartbreaking, that she would receive the strength that she needs from you, that you would bless her life and her family and allow her, oh God, to make the decisions that she needs to make for her to be well in body and in spirit. We pray, O oh Lord, for the good things that are coming into our midst, for the joy that you bring with each new day, for hope that is on the horizon in the midst of this pandemic, for uh, vaccines that are arriving as more and more in our congregation are able to be vaccinated, God, we give thanks to you for medical miracles. We give thanks to you for hope. We give thanks to you for one another as we continue to seek uh, after care for each other and support each other in this really difficult season. And God, especially this morning, we give thanks to you uh, for Roberta we pray, O oh Lord, that uh, as she prepares for retirement, that you would provide peace for her in her heart and in her life. May this be a time of joy and thanksgiving for new adventures await. And allow us, O oh God, to uh, help make this transition with grace and hearts full of love and life for all that you bring to us. Hear us now, O oh God, as we join our voices together in one voice to pray in earnest the words that Jesus taught to us. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join in singing together, I want to walk as a child of the light.
Let us pray. O holy and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Friends, the season of Epiphany has always been about seeing the light that is Jesus the Christ shining forth in our lives. But seeing is only the first step. The presence of Christ calls forth a response from us. And we continue this series, we're ending this series today, called Where You Lead. It's about the church and each of us that make up the body of Christ together in our response to the light, to walk in the path of Jesus each and every day, to follow. It is the mission of the church to make disciples, even as we are being made disciples. It's an ongoing process to follow Jesus, a transformation that continues throughout our lives. We come again and again, declaring, where you lead, O Lord. Last week, we talked about how Christ's healing uh, compels us to service and to deeper spiritual disciplines. This week, our final week in the series, uh, we reach the culmination of Epiphany, where uh, we, along with a select few of Jesus' disciples, bear witness to the physical manifestation of God's light and love in Jesus, the fullness of who Jesus is. And one of the things that I will uh, never forget about my experiences uh, early on in, in my faith journey uh, were taking uh, trips, uh, those mission trip kind of things, right? They're like a critical part of, of youth ministry, right? We do them with our youth here. We uh, take kids to different parts of the country. Um, some people do them to different parts of the world. Uh, but the idea is to um, act out of your faith and that, that call to service to go somewhere and serve someone, right? To, to be of support and help to someone who is in need or a community that's in need. To do some good work somewhere in the world out of the faith that we share together. And so those were really critical moments for me. Um, they uh, helped to inform who I am uh, as, as a disciple. They helped to, to shape my faith. They helped to bring me to where I am today. Uh, but there's one trip I, I remember we took, there's one place we took when I was a high school student, went there a few times uh, during the summer, and uh, it was a huge facility that they, they put us in, this giant warehouse they had everybody together in, and they had, um, had set up the, the floor of this warehouse into, into sleeping quarters, essentially, right? Um, and so you had hundreds, literally hundreds of youth and their, uh, their adult leaders uh, who were sleeping in this huge, enormous warehouse together. Uh, but the way that they chose to, to wake people up in the morning was uh, to flip on the lights and immediately begin blaring, just absolutely blaring, like the loudest, most obnoxious uh, Christian music that you could possibly think of, like contemporary Christian music. Um, and it was jarring, uh, to say the least, to wake up to that. Uh, but to their credit, I don't know how you wake up several hundred youth at once to get them going in the morning uh, without that sort of like just shock and awe kind of thing. So uh, we, would, uh, we would wake up to that and then we'd go and have breakfast and prepare for the day and go out into the community that surrounded this place and, and to go do, uh, go do work. Um, it's very efficient means of getting everyone together, but it was always uh, waking up in this bright light and in this confusion and uh, sort of not really always understanding what was happening. And then the entire trip, right, the entire trip was uh, a transformational experience, something that I point to as a mountaintop experience for myself. Hear this word this morning of a mountaintop experience that comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them to the top of a very high mountain where they were alone. He was transformed in front of them, and his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if they had been bleached white. Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking with Jesus, and Peter reacted to all of this by saying to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let's make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice spoke from the cloud, This is my son, whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. 
And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the human one had risen from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God, for which we say, thanks be to God. Amen. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. It's a complicated word there, uh, but it describes uh, being transformed or revealing in transformation, right? Jesus is transfigured, transformed, uh, changed into not something new, but changed in, in revelatory ways to the disciples, right? They see Jesus for who he is in his fullness, And that is a terrifying moment for them, and they don't know what to do, and everything seems very confusing. But there's some really important, significant details here as we wrap up Epiphany, this season of Epiphany, right? Here in this Transfiguration Sunday, in the scripture, we hear a voice of God speak out from a cloud, this is my son, my beloved, and listen to him. Right? We began our first Sunday in Epiphany as with that same voice speaking from a cloud as the heavens parted and a dove descended, uh, the spirit descended like a dove on, on Jesus at his baptism. Our book ended with the voice of God breaking forth into the world, whether it's for Jesus' knowledge of who he is or it's for our knowledge or the disciples' knowledge and understanding, right? God speaks into the midst of our lives in Epiphany and it is the light of God uh, that is, it's blinding to these disciples and it's revelatory to us. The light of Jesus' divinity shines out here before Peter, James, and John, and us. It's an experience that these few disciples don't know how to handle, but it is, it is amazing. They see Jesus for who he truly is, the Son of God, literally God among them. And, they, and then Jesus is joined by, by Moses and Elijah, heroes of their faith, people uh, only once known to these disciples in their, their history and, and, and stories and scripture. And here they are tangible before them. Peter, James, and John are so elated that they immediately begin making plans, right? This is a moment that we need to capture. This is a moment that we need to contain. It's a moment that we, we need to celebrate. So they prepare to build, build tents, make housing. Let's stay here. This is obviously the, the pinnacle. This is it, right? This is where our faith has led us to this moment. And it's hard to, uh, hard to blame them for that feeling. We, we know this story continues. This is not the pinnacle. This is not the moment that, and this is not the end all be all. So we know this goes on. But it would be difficult for any of us in similar circumstances to, to not sort of make the same error because we don't know what's happening here, right? This is beyond the, the realm of our experience. This is outside of, of what we uh, kind of know to be our our world and our reality, but here we are confronted with a change that is taking place among us, the voice of God, light that is blindingly bright. People who we know have been dead are legends in their own right before us. So the disciples want to stay in this moment. The reality, however, is that they can't. They have to go The clarity that they experience is not meant to uh, last. It's not meant to just be there forever. Because there's a lot that's still left to be done, both for the disciples and for Jesus. The glory of the mountaintop leads them to believe that their journey is over, but the valley awaits them. And the valley will be more difficult than anything that they could ever have imagined. Transfiguration is the the culmination and temporary end to this season of light that is epiphany. It's the moment at which the light of Christ is most evident for us before Easter. It's also the moment that dissipates the quickest. This week, we will encounter Ash Wednesday. We won't even make it to the next Sunday before change begins to take place. And as we encounter Ash Wednesday and we prepare to to make that confession from dust we came into dust we shall return. It might be hard to to see and feel that light. It's not that the light is gone. 
And there's a light brighter than even the light of Jesus' transfiguration here. It's a light which is the church's sole reason for existence. It's the light of Jesus' resurrection. The reality that we are, in fact, Easter people, and that is coming. But between the light of transfiguration and the light of resurrection, there is a great valley to be, to be traversed. It's the valley we call Lent. It's a season of prayerful reflection, of repentance, of fasting, and spiritual preparation for the glory of our Lord's resurrection, for a better day coming. But to get there, we have to walk a difficult path. To get there, Jesus needs to face the cross and the tomb. While we're here on the mountaintop, the disciples are probably also running through their minds that this isn't the only mountaintop moment in our scripture. And the books of Deuteronomy and Exodus, they contain mountaintop experiences as well, several of them, but one that they share in common is Moses rising to the top of Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, to encounter the living God. It's there that we also hear the weakness and uh, and short-sightedness, the the lack of understanding that we have as people. As Moses descends the mountain and finds that people have kind of gone astray. They haven't been able to ascend that mountain with him and so left in the valley they get confused and are lost. As Moses communes with God, the people are anxious and wander, but God does not leave them. God does not leave us. God gives Moses the tablets, instruction for the people, guidance to help them to live and lead holy lives. And it doesn't guarantee their success, but it provides them a path on which to walk. And Peter and James and John are given help as well. And the vision that they receive confirms their faith, provides them with a vision of what is yet to come so that when they descend the mountain, when they approach Jerusalem and when Jesus is arrested and crucified, they have a path on which to walk. Following Jesus, one foot in front of the other, making that choice where you lead, O Lord, I will follow. Jesus takes three of his closest disciples up to the top of a high mountain, a place secluded but not removed from the world, so that they can encounter and experience the light of Christ. Jesus does this because they need to be prepared. They need to know why it is they're going to to sweat and they're going to march and they're going to, to bleed. These mountaintop moments, whether it's the birth story or the transfiguration or the resurrection, are shaped and colored by the life that Jesus lives. And so when we, when we open up our lives, when we open up our homes, our churches to, to other people, and we begin to exemplify the life of Jesus, the Son of God, if we're willing to walk like Jesus walked, talked like he talked, and treat others the way that Jesus treated the least of these, we let the light and love of Jesus Christ shine out from our lives. And letting the Son of God shine in our lives is something that is radically transformational, not just for us, but for the world. So as we close out our our season of epiphany, of light and mountaintops, of transformation, I think what we find is that we need, we need Lent. We need the valley. We need the ashes on Ash Wednesday. We need the difficult places in spiritual life. We need to know what it is to to pick up our cross and follow so that as we journey from grace to grace, from the grace of our creation to the grace of our own transformation in Christ, the world might be transformed with us. Those mission trip experiences, as I said, were critical to shaping me as a disciple of Jesus Christ. I wouldn't have the faith that I have without them. But what I know now, and I didn't know then, was that it wasn't the trip, uh, it wasn't the trips themselves that made me who I am. As exciting and uh, incredible as those experiences were, 
every time I was tempted to try and, and collect those moments, those experiences, and sort of just set them on a shelf somewhere in my life. Like the goodness of those moments were so good that you just, you don't want it to, to be tainted by any of the sort of ordinariness, the regularness of life. If I didn't integrate anything into my life from those experiences, if I didn't let them uh, be infused with everything else that was going on in my life, if I didn't take lessons from them and, and use them in a path of discipleship, then nothing really would have changed at all. I would have some really good moments, but not a good foundation. I would have missed out on the greater transformation that would come between those mountaintops. The greater transformation that would be, uh, that would help to inform those moments, why they're important, and what they mean. What happened on that mountaintop in our scripture was not so much a change into something different, but a revealing of the essence of the one who was changed. And who was changed there wasn't the disciples. It was, uh, excuse me, who was changed there wasn't the disciples. It was Jesus who became who he was on that mountain, even though he was who he was as he climbed up the mountain and he was who he was as they descended back down it. He always is who he is. He's always present in, present in the fullness of his being, even if we cannot uh, perceive that, even if we can't experience that, even if only we see a part of who Jesus is, the part that we need at any given moment. We get used to that. We get used to just taking the peace, a dimension of who Christ is. And it would be a mistake to assume that the change in Christ uh, that, that we experience there in those places, those, those moments of, of mountaintops, the, those same moments that the disciples experienced, it would be a mistake for us to assume that that's the culmination, the end, the result, the pinnacle, and not a revelation of what was and is and will be. Even so, every now and then we catch a glimpse of something larger, something deeper, something more profound. Every now and then we hear a word that, that sticks in our lives for weeks, if not a lifetime, like when you step in gum and you get it on the bottom of your shoe and then now every time you walk it just keeps pulling at you and reminding you that it's there. Every, every now and then we, we swell with emotion as we catch a glimpse of glory and every now and then a lump comes up to our throats as we encounter the depths of love and sacrifice in Christ and every now and then we climb a mountain and we see who it is that we're following uh, through what is most often shadows and valleys of this life and, and every now and then we move a little bit closer and we explore a little deeper and we listen a little better and we realize that who and what we are even as we grow and change in a path of discipleship who and what we are is possible only because of Jesus the mountaintop equips us, equips us for life, to live faithfully, even while the mountaintops are so far off in the distance we can't even see them. The light of Christ powers us up to shine like the sun, even in the valley, so that as we prepare to descend this mountaintop of epiphany, as we prepare to enter uh, and to a season of, of surrender, we prepare our hearts and lives for that. I encourage you to, to not simply give something up over the next few weeks, but to gain, to take with you hope and courage, to take with you a, a faith practice that sustains you and a prayer on your lips where you lead, O Lord, I will follow. Amen.
friends, get ready to serve the Lord. Go in peace and joy, sharing the good news of Jesus' welcoming message and transforming love and power for all people. And as we go, let us share in our benediction together, saying, go in peace, love God, and serve others. Amen.